to look at the uh, specifics of the Day of Atonement <clears throat> and the events, and therefore uh, at the onset, it will be good to read quite a few scriptures to get an idea of what takes place. <clears throat> For me, what I try to do is um, I try to get a picture in my mind of what happened what took place. I, I, I want to sort of be able to see exactly what the high priest is doing on the great day of atonement. <clears throat> and um, so we're going to get into some of that and maybe awaken you to some different uh, things that took place. Leviticus chapter 16 <clears throat> and verse 3. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place. <clears throat> and one thing I want you to notice um, is the word place there is italicized in your Bible. And that means that that word was added by the writers. <clears throat> and if you, and I've said this before, but if you check through a whole lot of this place where it uses the term holy place, it's not talking about the place where the showbread is and the candlestick and the altar of incense. It's talking about the holy of holies. <clears throat> that's something that you should check out and you should follow through in. But nonetheless, I've seen that very definitely uh, it has been used in, uh, as, as the Holy of Holies. All right. So he should come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering <clears throat> and a ram for a burn offering. Okay, that right there may be new information for some of you. <clears throat> Hi, Nicole. Welcome back. It may be new information for some of you because many have believed that the high priest went into the <clears throat> Holy of Holies one time. <clears throat> and you may get that from the fact that everybody always says the high priest only went into the Holy of Holies one time a year. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he only went into that compartment one time. <clears throat> He only went in one time a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement. <clears throat> and as I've said in previous classes, I found at least two times and maybe three where he, on that particular day, goes into the Holy of Holies, does something, comes back out, goes back into the Holy of Holies, does something, and comes out. So at least two times. <clears throat> and to notice <clears throat> that this just, he didn't just go in there with a sin offering. Boom, everything's atoned for, it's over with. That's kind of a mentality I think some have had that that was it. He went in one time, he went in there with a, one sin offering, did the work, came out to the people, everybody rejoiced and said, good, our sins are covered and we're in good shape for another year. Okay. <clears throat> this uh, points out that he not only went in there with a sin offering, and notice specifically this first time it was a a bullock, a young bullock or a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. These rams <clears throat> are playing a big part because we're going to see at least four. Four different rams that are being <clears throat> offered. In this case, it's being offered for a burnt offering, not a sin offering. <clears throat> All right. And he shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments, therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burn offering. <clears throat> okay? So... Um, we're already, he's already dealt with a bullock and a ram. Now he's going to take two goats, <clears throat> one for a sin offering and another for a burn offering. Okay? There's going to be more goats here in just a minute. <clears throat> All right, verse 6. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering 
which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. Now I want you to notice <clears throat> that the high priest is making an atonement for himself and for his house. And notice the wording which is for himself and for his house. <clears throat> All right, because we'll get into the explanations a little later. Right now we're, we're going to just be reading to try to figure this thing out. All right. Now <clears throat> he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. <clears throat> okay. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer it for a sin offering. <clears throat> but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat, he shall present alive before the Lord to make an atonement with it, to let it go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. All right, so now we have two goats. <clears throat> Both of them are one offering. One of it is killed, and the other one is let go into the wilderness. All right? Verse 11, and notice it's sort of skipping back and forth to what's going on here. <clears throat> and, I, and here's the reason why I believe it's skipping. <clears throat> For example, if the Lord, I, I don't know that on the great day of atonement, he offered a bullock and a burnt offering, and then the fire of God fell and burned it up, and then he offered a goat for the people and a burnt offering, and the fire of God fell. I, th I think that all of this was received and accepted of God in one fell swoop, June, <clears throat> in that sense. Just like it happened with Jesus. All of the offerings were fulfilled in one moment, one fell swoop. When Jesus was the burnt offering, was the sin offering, was the peace offering, was every fulfillment of every offering, the red heifer, every offering that ever was. <clears throat> All right. Um, verse 11, when I read that uh, it is for himself, you must keep in mind that Jesus as the high priest did not sin. Correct? So you would say, <clears throat> Well, this part of the offering doesn't count then, but I believe that it does. I just believe that it has a different <clears throat> aspect. Um, instead of it being for Jesus, it is, it is for Jesus to do by himself. <clears throat> and I'll explain that in just a minute. And it does end up for his house. <clears throat> All right. Verse uh, 12. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off of the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony <clears throat> that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock. Okay, so you have this whole little part with the incense. It's also taken place. Now, verse 14, And he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. <clears throat> then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood within the veil and do with that, uh, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. All right, so if you notice, he's come within the veil twice now. The first time he did it with the bullock, the second time he is told to do it exactly, the, with the goat, exactly the way you did with the bullock. That's significant. You do exactly what he doesn't, he does not repeat or he does not retell what you're supposed to do. He says, do the same thing you did with the bullock with, that you do with the goat. Okay? <clears throat> All 
and verse uh, 16, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression and all their sins, and so, so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remains among them in the midst of, the, of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place. And we know that he doesn't make atonement in the holy place. Can I get an amen from somebody? Okay. He makes atonement in the holy of holies. <clears throat> all right. So until he come out and have made atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. So he's saying nobody's in that tabernacle but him until this is finished. All right. <clears throat> Verse 18, and he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement of it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat, and put it upon the horns of the altar round about, and he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times, and cleanse it, and hallow it <clears throat> from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he hath finished atoning for the holy place, and the tabernacle of the congregation, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Remember, there were two goats chosen. One they, they drew lots. One, the lot fell to be the Lord's goat, and he was killed. How many of you want to be the Lord's? You are chosen for death. <clears throat> now we're going to find out what happened to the live goat. Um, what verse was I in? <clears throat> 20. And when he had finished atoning for the holy place and for the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar... He shall bring the live goat. And I want you to notice something here in verse 20. He has with the death of the first goat atoned for the holy of holies and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And the very next word after that, he shall bring the live goat and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. All right. There's two goats. One offering. The first goat's death. The first, according to this, the first goat's death atoned for the holy of holies the tabernacle and the altar. The second goat had, was for the children of Israel. The first one was cleansing the tabernacle in his death. The second one is bearing all of their iniquities away. You see the difference? Two goats, two different responsibilities within this, within this thing. <clears throat> Um, all right, <clears throat> and um, all right, and then shall send it away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness, and the goat shall bear upon it all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. All right, so you get the picture: two goats, one, one offering. One's killed, one's left alive. One atones for the tabernacle and everything. The other one literally bears all of the people's sins, failures, mistakes, all of that, and is taken by a certain person into the wilderness, a place that is not inhabited, and let go. And out there, that's where all the wild beasts and everything is and let go, and he's still alive. There's death, and there's being alive. And both of them are atoning for the sins and bringing about the great atonement on the, on the uh, uh, Day of Atonement. <clears throat> All right. 
And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place. Notice, it's still using that same phrase, holy place, and the word place is italicized, and every time it's used it before, it was holy of holies. So if this is true, here's another time that he went into the holy of holies. Do you at least see what I'm talking about here? I mean, there's, in my mind, there's, three and possibly even four times that he goes into the Holy of Holies and comes back out. Three times he goes in, comes back out, well, four. Uh, if he goes in, changes his clothes, goes out, gets the bullock, does with all of that, goes in, offers that, comes back out, gets a goat, the goat that was the Lord's goat, goes back in, does that, <clears throat> comes back out, puts the blood on the altar and does all of that, goes back in and changes his clothes. Anybody, was anybody aware that he possibly went in as many as four times on the Day of Atonement? I mean, that's a lot of getting in there with God, you know. <clears throat> all right. So he shall put, put those off when he went into the and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place. Now notice here the word holy place doesn't have an italicized thing. So it could very well be what we call the holy place and not the holy of holies. Um, and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people, make an atonement for himself and for the people, and the fat of the sin offering shall be shall he burn upon the altar. And he who let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterwards come into the camp. I want you to notice this because I think it's going to come up later on. Afterwards come into the camp. Strange phrasing here and might, might be bringing up something. And the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make an atonement in the holy place shall, shall one carry forth outside of the camp and they shall burn in the fires their skins and their flesh and their dung. And he who burneth them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterwards he shall come into the camp. This shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make the atonement and put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments, and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. And that word there is that that's the holy of holies. <clears throat> and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statue unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. All right. Um, so I took a little bit of special time to, to point out things and read stuff. Let's see. <clears throat> I think there was some in Exodus. No. We went over Exodus 28, and Exodus 28 is primarily dealing with the garments and all that kind of stuff. All right, now let's, let me look, let's look in Leviticus 8. I think there's something to be read there. <clears throat> yes. Well, okay. And the Amplified would know. Would, it would know more than all other Bibles, actually. 
Um, no, this is dealing with what we dealt with with the consecration of the priests. All right, so the entrance of the high priest in the holiest the first time was, according to the scriptures we just read, not for the people, but for himself. All right, Aaron and every high priest but Jesus had sinned, and so they needed a bullock for their sin. But Jesus fulfilled this by doing it for himself, or you could say done by himself. And I'll explain that in just a minute. <clears throat> he did it, but he did it for us. He did it for his family. Now, let's look in uh, Hebrews 6 so that we can see what Hebrews has to say about this. Um, let's, uh, let's, we're shooting for the last verse, but let's start at verse 18. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuse to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Now, I want you to notice it's using this picture of an anchor and of a ship and it is saying, this is an anchor to the soul. A ship is in a storm. And he's on top of the water and the storm is beating the ship. But he's got a line fastened all the way down to something solid. Can I get amen from anybody? To something solid that keeps it from, you know, obviously it's moving. But it's not moving away from it's established thing. Is there movement in the soul? Oh, baby. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's rough to be tossed about in the storm. But it is anchored. So it is, in that sense, immovable. Now he's about to change the picture. All right, so let's, let's read... Uh, 19 again, which we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Here's the, chain, the picture chain. And which entereth into that within the veil, where the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right. Very, very interesting wording here. I mean, really, really, if you really, really look at, at what it just said, it used the picture of needing an anchor to the soul, and it used an anchor to hold it down, hold the ship down, but then it says, but it's really not down into the earth, it's really up into the heavens, through the veil. In other words, the anchor really is in the Holy of Holies. Get it? And there, there is something done that even in the storm you can be anchored. All right? So let's look at this picture just a little closer here. Both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. It's saying that we enter into that. It's saying, which entereth into that within the veil where, where also the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It has just described two things. It has described us in the storm who have the possibility who have the promise, who have the immutable counsel of God that you too can enter in there and anchor there 
regardless of what you're going through. Is that basically what it's saying? I mean, tell me if it's not. But I believe that that is what it's saying. But even as it's saying that, it's saying that based on something. And what it is based on is that we can enter in within the veil where the forerunner for us entered past tense. For us, entereth into that within the veil. Is that, does anybody find that interesting using the word entereth, which means the ETH on the end of it means that there's an ongoing entering. Do you see that? There is an ongoing, you know, there are, believe it or not, many of you may not know this, but there are many trials in life. And there will be many more. And you will need to enter many times to keep your anchor there. But there is something immutable about this, unchangeable about it. Even when your soul is rocking and rolling and you know it's time to entereth again, there's something verse 20 describes, and that is where, where the forerunner is for us entered. Jesus has already entered there. There's something already settled. You're not settling it. You're resting in what's settled. It's not dependent on you, and it's not dependent on your soul, and it's not dependent on right circumstances or comfortable circumstances or circumstances that, um, may I say it, circumstances that calm your soul. You may still be tossed in the storm, but still anchored. Okay? The thing that makes that sure, remember we read that in verse 18, the thing that makes that immutable, what does the word immutable mean? Unchangeable. What a, you know, I like that personally, you know, because it's like, okay, by two immutable things, and you go, what the heck is immutable? You know? And then you find out it means unchangeable, and you go, well, that's a big word that he's trying to signal with flags by two incredibly unchangeable things that God cannot lie and that because it looks like he only mentions that one, you know, two immutable things and he says God can't lie. And you go, well, what's the other one? Anybody, has anybody ever asked that? I have, you know. <laughs> you know, don't tell me there's two and then just give me one, you know. But the, the other one is, is that he has entered already into this for us, okay? Now, the other interesting part to this is, it calls him a forerunner, which is somebody that is going in on their own. Going in on their own. Now, I believe these two main trips into the Holy of Holies represent what we talked about in, who knows, whatever course I taught last time, you know, sacrifices or priesthood, one of those, probably priesthood, where I was talking about two different kinds of priesthood. How many of you remember me talking about two different kinds of priesthood? How many of you could probably name what the, the, the definitions I gave for the two different kinds of priesthood? There's a certain kind of priesthood and another kind. How many raise your hand if you think you could name the two? Well, you can name one. That's good. Well, let's try, let's, let's try uh, Jennifer. It, both or either one. Somebody want to help her? Mediator. <clears throat> yeah, the mediator makes us one. 
And then, it, it, even in the wording here, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's an interesting wording there. In my opinion, it almost sounds like he went in as an Aaron priest to fulfill all of the Old Testament types, requirements, and as an Aaronic priest, if you will, as a, let's say, a mediator priest, fulfilled all of those types and was made, from now on, a communion priest forever. Is that cool to anyone? It is to me. All right. Now, remember, we talked about two trips into the Holy of Holies. In my opinion, I believe that Jesus went in the first time in type and shadow of that bullock as the mediator to come do a work for us, just like it says, for his family. Remember we read that? That he, it says for himself and for his family. But I believe he did this for those who would become one. Did he not, did he not die for everybody? Yes. But he did this mediatorship so that whoever, whosoever will, could become one. Everybody isn't going to become one, right? Everybody will not do it. But he made a way for oneness in his work as a forerunner. Forerunner meaning, you know, John the Baptist was a forerunner of Jesus. Can I get an amen? What does that mean? Well, he, he was there. Oh, you can say a yeah, forerunner means that Jesus was, or John was there for, before Jesus. He's a forerunner. He ran in this race before Jesus. And he, he was before him to point back to him. All right. So I believe that Jesus went in on his own as carrying the bullock to do a mediator work. And the second time he went in was with us in terms of a goat. And I think the bullock has always represented more the Lord and the servant and the self-giving one on his own. And the goat really is a good picture of us. You know? It really is. All right. So um, let's, let's look at a few other scriptures. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. <clears throat> uh, let's read uh, verse 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus or Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. All right. In terms of going in as the bullock, that's Jesus just himself as a mediator and as a forerunner. And it says here even that he is, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. In other words, it's something he did on his own that we found out later that he mediated a work for us. We were not there in that sense. He was working on our behalf. Now most of, this is not, this is not new for most Christians. <laughs> most Christians, that's pretty much all they believe. And that is, Jesus died for us, Jesus did a work for us, we weren't there. We didn't know anything about it. We found out about it in due time, and glory to God, I'm saved. Can I get an amen? That's the basic thing that most people call the gospel, which I believe is just the beginning. I believe you've, you've just stepped in through the door of the tabernacle, and you haven't even gotten to that altar yet in the true sense of what it all represents. All right. So, uh, and then back to Hebrews, uh, but this time chapter 9. Uh, Hebrews 9.15. 
And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. All right. A lot, uh, there's a lot of stuff there. He is the mediator of the new covenant. All right, he's not just your mediator. He is mediating a new covenant. You know, we always say, Jesus is my mediator. He stands in between me and God and keeps me safe. Boy, no, he was mediating something for you, and it even describes it right here. Um, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first time, they who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. The end goal here of the mediator work is communion, eternal inheritance. That's the end goal. All right. So, back to our picture. He, he, Jesus goes in as, as the bullock. As such, he's a mediator. He's doing a work for us. In that sense, we are not there. He's doing it for us who are out there. Okay? He goes back out, and now he takes a goat. And this goat, he kills this goat. And he takes that, the, that blood and goes in, as it were, as that one, but that represents something completely different. That represent we're the goat now, but it's his death. He, he who knew no sin was made to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so here, as the goat, we are now entering in with him. And I'll read a few things that will help, help you see that a little bit more. The first, he moves in as a mediator with the bullock. The second time, he goes in as a communion priest and is made uh, a Melchizedek priest, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, so that from now on, forevermore, the communion is done. Now, interestingly enough, it wasn't done under the Old Covenant, but with Jesus it was done because he was that goat, he was the Lord's goat. He was the Lord's choice. And yet, he joined with us, and now, okay, so, so let's just clarify this. In the New Testament, there is an abundance of scripture about what Jesus did for us without us even being there or knowing anything about it. Amen? Common knowledge. But we, of this persuasion, have learned that there's also an abundance of scripture that deal with the fact that we were one with Jesus. Just the most common, I, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. There, there's a taking to the altar where I'm included in that. He's not just doing it for me. He's doing it as me and with me and in oneness with me. Does that make sense to everyone? should be pretty clear. That's what the, the bullock and the goat represent. The bullock represents the forerunner, and the goat represents the communion of making us one and bringing us in. Okay? I know, I, you know, it's a long time and a lot of laboring, but it took me a while to see this. And I believe that there's incredible value to comprehending what happened behind that veil. That's where I'm supposed to be anchored. I'm supposed to get, get dig these words, strong consolation. <laughs> strong consolation you know my conclusion is this when I don't have strong consolation apparently I don't really know what happened or I'm not resting in it or I'm not it's not that I'm not resting in it it's that I'm not laying hold of it I'm not entering entereth in entereth in I'm not doing that again and finding that real and true. And what happens when we don't? We start looking around the earth for answers. Well, I need this. Well, I, if this, you know, here's, here's our dumb thought. Well, if this would happen, everything would be perfect. Do you really, I mean, do you really believe that? I mean, that's, you know. Well, yeah, I really do, except for there's going to be something else that, that bumps your whatever. Anybody ever... 
uh, like today I was working on something and, and uh, I bent my thumb way back, you know, it just, you know, and you just don't realize, you know, you just bump it all the time after that. You just walk around, you, go, you know, you know, you hit a strong, go, ah, you know, and you're going, gosh, man, you know, and if it was something even less likely than that, if it was your little toe or, or a, uh, you know, one of your toes right in between there, you know, uh, you'd bump it all the time. You go, God, this is crazy. I'm never aware of it till it hurts. Well, trust me, if you got a problem, you're going to bump it no matter how, you know, you try to cushion your environment. Enough said on that. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> um, all right, now let's just let's deal with the fact of the incense. <clears throat> and uh, that's back in Leviticus 16. We just read it, but probably wouldn't hurt to turn there. Leviticus 16, verse... Um, verse 12. Here it describes that he takes... Uh, a sensor, and that's a container that is going to be, it, it, it's a, kind of a little uh, vessel that you open up and you put the coals from off the altar into it. And what he's going to do is he's going to put incense on it and it's going to start, the, the fragrance is going to start rising. And he carries that in and waves it before the, whole, the uh, mercy seat, and then he fills the room with this incense, this sweet savor, and then he does the blood. So let me just read here. Then he takes a censer, gets coals, burning coals from off the altar, and this is, uh, this is interesting too because he's getting coals from off the brazen altar and he comes in, and, and I believe that two things happen. I believe that he, he uh, takes those coals and he puts those on the golden altar, the altar of incense. And that he puts incense on that, and he also puts coals in his sensor. Of course, he's carried those from his sensor to the golden altar. But he leaves some in there, and that 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 the incense rises even in the holy place and begins to penetrate before he even gets in there. And I think there's uh, proof for that. Nisi and I, were, or she actually shared it with me about uh, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about as almost as if the, the golden altar was inside the Holy of Holies. Didn't you share that with me? When that you? And it's like, well, that's a weird way of putting it, you know. Um, but it makes sense to me that there's already a penetration beginning to happen, a movement into the Holy of Holies, which is that, because it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, that sweet incense, that sweet savor is Christ and begins to penetrate into there. And then he takes the censer and he goes in inside and, and at that point he puts the incense on those coals and begins to wave it before the mercy seat and totally fills it with the sweet savor of Christ. Uh, let's see if I can get how I wrote this. He gets burning coals from off the altar and fills both hands with sweet incense. Both He fills his hands with this. You know, a lot of times our hands are filled with all kind of stuff. You know, not not the sweet savor of Christ. And he brings it in. And the, pri uh, the priest's two hands were full of this sweet incense nature. That's the way I wrote it. They're full of this sweet incense nature and brought to the altar of incense. This was no cross of destruction, talking about the altar. Altar. It was no cross of destruction, but was a golden altar. A gold, it was an altar, but it was a golden altar. Do you know what gold represents? Deity. 
what in the world kind of picture are we getting all of a sudden? And what sort of savor is going to be coming off a golden altar? Not a brazen altar, not a brass altar, not an, not an altar of destruction and blood. Folks, this golden altar never had, had, never was anything ever killed on it. Never. There was, there was nothing killed on it that was a sin offering or of a sin nature. There was something that died on it, but it wasn't killed. What died? The incense. It died to its material form. It lost its outward form and came forth in another form. There was a death, there was a loss, there was a decrease, but there was an increase. But it was not a death in the sense of a murder. It was not a death in the sense of killing something. It was, it was not a blood altar. Blood was sprinkled on it, but nothing died there and shed its blood. So we're talking, we're not talking about an altar of destruction. We are looking, we are being confronted with things that are right in front of the veil. God is speaking strong. It's right centered just before you go into the Holy of Holies. It's right there. It's screaming at us. There is still an altar, no matter what you left back there, but it's a different spirit. It's a different kind. It's of a different nature. This is a golden altar. And here there is not a, a, a horrible smell of death and of blood and of gore and all this. Here there's a sweet savor coming off of it that is satisfying the Lord. Hmm. So we need to be awakened to things beyond sin and failure. and We need to be awakened to a death that is sweet. What does that scripture say in uh, was it? Happy in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, something like that. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Well, what kind of God is this? I mean, when I was first saved, I remember reading that. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of what are you talking about? You know, I was already indoctrinated with, you know, the prosperity, you know, God's working for you, all this. I'm going, no, no, God wants us to live. God wants us to be happy. It's all about us. You know, it's all about making us happy and, and, and comfortable. And that's why we receive Jesus. You know, I'm sitting there doing that. And if he did it, he'd have nail scars in his hands, you know. His nail scars were not all about a brazen altar of death and destruction because he fulfilled all types and shadows. Okay? Now, I want to get into that. I'll probably have to wait till next class to get into that a little more. <clears throat> um, so I wrote, when the beauty of Jesus' self-giving nature comes into contact with the trials of life and of the cross, it yields a sweet savor to the Father. And that's what the incense on that golden, or on that altar and on that fire in the censer represent. And that is the beauty of Jesus' self-giving nature coming into contact with the fires and the trials of life and instead of being murdered Jesus gave himself Do you, are you getting the picture that this is declaring to us something about Jesus Jesus is that incense and those coals and that fire, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials. Well, you know, can you imagine the incense that has been prepared by priests and worked on and brought together and set aside for the day that they would be finally released into the true 
purpose for their life um, uh, on the Day of Atonement, the biggest day of the year, and you, you drop the, that incense on those coals, and they go, oh, what is this? We, were, we smelled good. We were, we were special. We were all of this. And, and they begin to think it's strange when in reality they had been brought to that by a different spirit than what was out there in the outer court in the death of relating to sin. Now it's finding a whole new purpose. And that sweet and, and that that sweet savor, that sweet nature of Christ, when it hits those trials, it just you know, the words I put is that it yields a sweet savor to the Father. Now is my soul troubled, Jesus said. Yes, there is trouble. What shall I say then? Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I to this hour. And I guess we'll have to get in this next class. But we really need to comprehend the one that we are one with. Because how can we ever function as one? Yes, we are one, but how can we ever function as one if we don't know what the one is like? And then just closing with this, and that is there is this, we have this misconception of what the cross is. We relate everything to the brazen altar. We've seen that much, and so it's just death and slaughter and, and, and so when we talk about death like this and we talk about self-giving, it's not a sweet savor. It's not a beautiful thing to us. We, we draw back from it. We, we are afraid of it. We don't like it. But I'm telling you to know the one is to know the golden altar and the sweet savor and to be one with him in it instead of just letting him be that way and you having a false picture of what that means and therefore fearing what you would never fear if you entered it by oneness. You would not fear it, you would embrace it. And, and it wouldn't be scary because it's not what you think it is. And I will say this and try to close now. It is the highest The golden altar and all that's taking place now on the Day of Atonement, it's moved past sin and failure. It's moved into eternal inheritance and oneness forever and the beauty of what all that means to his heart and should mean to our heart. Did you have something you wanted to share real quick? Can you speak really good? I'm not going to try to repeat all that. We'll just end now and come back in a few minutes, all right? You're dismissed.